Uh, I mentioned about the military housing. Another thing that is excluded for military members is when they go overseas, so if you've got somebody who's in Afghanistan, they get paid what's called combat pay above and beyond their normal military salary because they're in a combat zone. We don't take that as a tax income for serving our country. And so even though their wages were inflated, we let them keep that without making it available back to the Congress decided to do that as well. Um, if you have a portion of your income where you're paying child support, that's not available to the family, so we do exclude that. Um, things like the earnings under cooperative education programs, we will see a lot of those, um, but work study earnings and things like that would be excluded for a student as well. So the things that we are like, all right, so here's how much you brought in, here's what's available. We, we need to know what's available to contribute to the student. So we want to subtract out stuff that we knew you had to pay, taxes being one of them. We can know for sure you pay taxes and that's not available to our students, so we're going to pull that out of your available income the formula. Um, and you'll notice the first three things are taxes. We can verify they paid them. It's going to be an exact dollar amount. It's easy for us to catch, so we exclude it. Um, then this income protection allowance that I talked about from this market basket of goods, that part, we pull out and we say, we know you have living expenses and this is what we are protecting. Now, what the income protection allowance does, and this is true on both the FM and the IM side, even though the amounts are a little bit different. Um, it kind of, it's designed to protect the things that you don't have discretion about, which means different things to different people. So let's say you make $30,000 a year for your family of four. And you live on that. We need them, everyone eats. You don't have a lot of discretionary income to send a kid to a real expensive school. In fact, most of your income for a family of four is going to be just paying the bills. However, in this country, that is not below the poverty line. That's, you know, a normal salary. I think the median income for a family of four right now in the United States is closer to around $58,000, or $58,62, depending on um, what factors you consider for a family of four. However, you can live on three. Let's take the family who makes $80,000 for a family of four. Now, what they're going to consider their bills and their needs is going to be very different. They're going to have a different standard of living than a $30,000 family. So they're going to have a higher rent. You're going to look at a $30,000 family and they're driving used cars, probably. They probably didn't go buy a new Lexus, right? Um, and so they probably have low car payments and relatively low rent. They're not living in a $500,000 home most of the time. The family making $85,000 has made different choices. And probably not extravagant choices. Not crazy. Um, they don't live in a multi-million dollar home. They're normal people. However, because of the choices that they made, we're going to assess them a higher amount that they should be able to spend on their kid, but their standard of living is probably a lot higher than our $30,000 family. Right? And so when you're having conversations with people and they talk about, you mean to tell me I need to live in X neighborhood? Well, we're talking about where you have no discretion. When people begin to make choices about what they choose to buy, the neighborhood they choose to live in, the type of car they're going to drive, not just if they have one, that's the part where we no longer begin protecting them because those are the only choices. Does that make sense? But you tell somebody that that's a choice and they will get angry at you. Because they don't, they don't see them as choices. And you know, to be fair, everybody's living at different standards and they've got expenses that we're not considering in that market basket. Um, but just so you know, income protection allowance doesn't mean we're protecting someone to live at the median income in the United States. They don't take somebody with it on between 58 and 62 for a family of four. That's not what they're using to protect. They're using just slightly above the poverty line. And then after that, you don't really have a lot of discretion. Does that make sense? So this is why the treatment feels part of So the income protection allowance, the breakdown in it, 30% uh, of it is food. Do you notice that? Most of the money goes to food in this case. <laughs> most Excuse of your monthly thank expenses you. go to food. What's your biggest monthly? Mortgage. You, you usually have it. Yeah. Right? You notice what happens when you start going to this. And it's saying 
20, 30% of food? <coughs> 22% housing, 9% transportation, 16% clothing, and, and you kind of see the breakdown about what we're covering. There's a lot of stuff not listed in there. Um, we also know that everybody has expenses related to their job. They drive to and from there. They probably had to buy clothes that are nicer than clothes they would normally wear in order to go to that job. So we protect a portion of people's income if they are employed. Um, now you'll notice it's different depending on the kind of family you are. A two-parent family, if they're both working, there's an amount. If you've got um, a two-parent family and one of them is not working, they're unemployed or they are working at home, um, but not earning wages, so a homemaker, there's no employment allowance because there's one person who potentially could work in this scenario in the government's model for the new Contributions from assets, cash, savings, checkings, net worth, investments. Um, we come up with, here, here's all your stuff. This is how much your net worth, like Bill Gates, only different numbers. Um, slightly different numbers. Um, and then we say, okay, we need to protect a portion of that for some things, and then what's left is your discretionary net worth. That's what is now available that you might be able to contribute for your student, because we know everybody needs some emergency savings. We know, and that's the asset protection allowance. It's like, you gotta have a little bit of emergency savings in there, because something could go wrong if you're protect. And we know that you might have um, other kids in the house, and so if you do, you gotta be saving for them to go to college. They want to encourage you to save, you send your children, so they are gonna let you save a little bit, and then protect that out of whatever you report your assets. <coughs> and then this is the formula for how we get there um, to the contribution from the assets. I could read these to you, but they are very dull and you will not remember them. Um, so we're going to use a, a table when we actually do our, our calculation worksheet. I just want you to understand what they're looking at with these slides. Um, a lot of people want to know what's going on with um, students who like save for uh, do 529 plans or they've got prepaid plans. Uh, a lot of states have money prepaid tuition plans where you go to in-state schools and have prepaid tuition. Florida is one of them that's very popular. Uh, for them, those count as, as a parent's asset. Even if they're in, I mean, they're usually allocated toward the student, but we put them in as a parent's asset. We'll talk more about that at the meeting in a couple of slides. Um, if it's owned by somebody other than a parent. So let's say a grandparent, aunt, uncle said, I'm going to set up one of these plans and set it aside for junior so that when they go to college, they can have some money. We don't look at it at all. <laughs> the reason being, it's owned by that other person. And at any moment in time, they could say, I'm not giving you that after all. <laughs> right? Now, we expect the parents, right? We, our expectation, our basic expectation with all of this is that it is a responsibility of students and their immediate family, their parents, pay for college. Not grandparents, not aunts and uncles, not friends, not neighbors, parents. And most students think they are independent and that it is not their parents' job. And the parents think that too. But it is in our mind. So if the parent sets it up, we count it as a parent asset. Anybody else, though, we have to ignore it because we can't guarantee that that person's going to follow through and actually get it. Make sense? Um, and it tells you rules about your independent students as well. Um, and if they've got plan set up for their kids. Um, a little more detail on two page versus Do you see this case on two pages? We have a fairly large population of students from Florida, so we see a lot of Florida two pages and a lot of them are from Florida and you don't see them, so you can kind of skip that section if that's all right with anybody. I'm not going to it. Um, small businesses. So the FAFSA asks a question that says, hey, do you own a business? What's it worth? Caveat being, if you have less than 100 full-time employees, we don't want to know about it. You're considered a small business and the government gives you a pass on your value. And a lot of families don't know that. So you'll get a FAFSA in and there'll be a business value in there because they're trying to be real honest. They're terrified of the government. They think you're the IRS and that you can come get them if they lie. And then other people don't do that. Um, <laughs> But for some, they're, they're very honest, and they'll put a number in there, and they really are a small business owner. They don't have a big business for an employee, 100 plus employees. And if that's the case, and you see that in your conversation with the student, and that's changed their EFC, 
might be something that you want to just get some documentation on and take out um, because that, that should not be in there if it's truly a small building. Um, and it has to be owned and operated by the family. So we're talking about things that, that they own that show up on their tax return, not something that's like a C corporation, it's a separate entity from them. Okay, I said we were going to get to this part about what you see on the FAFSA and what questions people get. It says it's been a while since everybody spilled one out. I will spend some time with this. Um, when, a, when a student sits down and fills out the FAFSA, they'll start <coughs> entering a name. They say whether or not they're a dependent student. The next section starts asking them about their income and assets, and it's going to ask them about their parents' income. When they fill the information in about their parents' income, if they enter that it is less than $50,000, and mom and dad either filed a 1040 easy or a 1040A, most time it's a 1040A, or they could have, who knows what's required in order to file a 1040A? What's the difference? Anybody know? Well, what's recorded, like interest, the different things, and then there's the difference in what the extent of what you have to report when it's 1040. The biggest thing that knocks people out of the running for the simplified needs test is itemized deductions. If you take itemized deductions at all, you can't file a 1048. Does that make sense? Um, and so a lot of people, if they write off medical, or if they own a home, and they still have a mortgage on it, they're writing off the interest. And so a lot of people can't file it. But for your family that rents, or maybe their home is, is paid for and modest and they have a low income, when they get to this section, if they meet all this criteria, they're never going to get asked questions about their savings account, their assets. They're going to go, this family is very needy. And we know from research that families from low income brackets are more likely to be first generation college students, are more likely to be filling this out on their own without parental help, potentially, especially if they are first generation college students. And we don't want this student to give up because the form is hard. We want them to go to college. And so, you know, have you heard about the Congress people who are talking about wanting to make the FAFSA the size of the postcard? Does everybody group this? There, there's, a, there's a push to make the FAFSA as small and easy as possible. And there's a congressman who holds up a postcard and thinks that ought to be the only, only question to be asked. And the reason is it's good hearted if it's not a great idea, I want to kind of learn. Those who are savvy could do a lot with that and spend a lot of taxpayer money on things that they shouldn't. But the idea is we don't want this to be a barrier, right? And so the simplified needs test is designed to take down the barrier. If you're a low-income family, the, the profile of people who are in these income brackets, if we ask them their asset information, the percentage of people who have any assets was so low that statistically they're willing to take the risk that since most of them aren't going to have any assets, we're not even going to ask them the question. And so that student is going to skip right to the end once they fill out that information. So the FAFSA for them is much shorter. We have electronic FAFSAs now, so it's a lot easier to do that than when we have paper. There, there are some issues with that. So if that student selected for verification, they didn't use data retrieval. When they retrieve their data, it turns out they made $51,000. That ICER is going to reject, and you're going to have to go out and get them to enter their asset information because it skipped those questions and turns out now they made $51,000 and now we need it. So there's a downside because sometimes it can cost some additional paperwork, but it does more good than harm in the government's mind and so that's why we use it. Any questions about the simplified needs test? Um, but if you, if you get the little ICER messages about why an ICER is not good, why Pell might not be dispersing for a student, and it says simplified needs test, this is why you need those aspects that skip that you might be able to Um, one of the things that qualifies for you is mean tested benefits, so temporary assistance for needy families, um, SNAP benefits, those items that we uh, also check for verification, WIC programs, um, all of these are only given to folks with, with need, and so by participating in those programs, they've already cleared the other ones, so as soon as they check the box and say they've got this kind of benefit, it skips the question form. And when it asks to them, it can be for anyone in the household. It doesn't mean that everybody's receiving that benefit, but anyone in their household, the 
because they are receiving that benefit. They're going to qualify for the simplified needs test. The second formula that's different from the normal one is auto zero EFC. Are people familiar with this? Same concept as the one before, which is we've got a really low income family. We want to ask them even fewer questions because we don't want to deter them. And the percentage of people that we used to make persist all the way through that we ended up having any EFC from was so small that it was worth just skipping it for everybody who meets these criteria. So for this one, um, if the family earned less than $24,000 a year, didn't have to file a Form 1040, or if they're a dislocated worker, or they received one of these benefit programs, it's not going to ask them anything. They're going to enter that information, and it's going to skip them, cruise them through all the way to the end of the class, and their ESC is automatically going to be zero, no matter what would have gone in those other boxes. Because the chances are that somebody who makes less than $24,000 a year also has $6 million in the bank is really small. Mostly because that $6 million would have interest to see that in um, So, my boss always said you should buy diamonds because those don't get interest and you can sell them for a lot of money and no one will be happy. <laughs> Free advice. <laughs> um, for dependent students, we're using parent information, obviously. Um, for independent students, we're going to use their information as well. Here's the problem with auto zero ESC. The benefit is, hey, you know, you don't have a lot of money, we're not going to make you fill out this whole form. The downside is, as soon as someone makes a little bit more, so we saw what, this is a little over $24,000, they make just a little bit more than that, suddenly they've got to answer these other questions, and they're not zero EFC. For simplified needs test, you know, if they make $50,000 or less, the minute they make, <clears throat> or if they make less than 50, the minute they make 50 even, and the government rounds up, so technically if they make forty nine 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 and losing ninety eight cents, we round up to fifty thousand dollars. They don't qualify for this anymore. And instead, their EFC, because they had to include their asset information, counts considerably. So there's this cliff effect for folks. Does that make sense? So we have information that we don't ask from anybody, and as soon as we ask it, those families pay a lot more. Um, I'm not going to break yet for the case study. I want to talk a little bit about IM, just as a comparison. That way, when we start our hand calcs, we really do anything. Before I move into institutional methodology, I know I haven't gone as in detail because it won't matter. It won't mean something to you until you actually sit down and start trying to use these numbers. But are there questions that you have about where we came up with these numbers or why we do what we do. Any questions on methodology? Okay, if you do think of one, just let me know. Don't look at this and don't cheat. So, I'm skipping over to the IM section. Um, this was developed by financial aid professionals because there was no federal methodology, so people started using something similar to this. And then when the federal methodology came along, you'll notice some of this was influenced by Congress and politics in the country of what they decided they were going to do. I will say, institutional methodology is primarily used by highly selective institutions. The types of applicants that apply to highly selective institutions tend to be people who are very savvy with their taxes. And so part of the reason, for instance, that Duke uses um, institutional methodology is because I cannot tell you how many students I see getting Pell Grants who live in multi million dollar homes. <coughs> and um, we can't prevent them from getting their Pell Grant because they are brilliant at doing their taxes. Brilliant. I've seen the most amazing things. And if I had lots of money, I could find it. I know I could. But we don't want to give them institutional money. And institutional methodology is only for your institutional funds. It doesn't affect your federal. We are legally ob obligated to give the taxpayer money for help. But we do not have to get into this money. And we need to know more information from them because we know the profile of our applicants are such that these are people who have the money a lot of times to pay people to be very clever accountants for them. And we just want to make sure that the people with the need get it. You know, the neediest people are the ones who are really getting the funds. But what we don't want is that student showing up in the residence hall 
with their roommate, and their roommate